disease and chronic illnesses. She also owns a private practice, <laughs> Seattle Direct Counseling, an online counseling and coaching service. Both are on WordPress. She's an avid endurance athlete at the Ironman and 100 uh, kilometer ultramarathon distances, loves cats, and uses all that time swimming, biking, and running everywhere to think of ways to get people to eat real food. Please welcome Ime Shu. In 2015, 
as was mentioned in my bio, um, I, I was already on the way of having been diagnosed with celiac disease, herpetiformis dermatitis, uh, which are both autoimmune diseases, and over 300 food allergies and intolerances. I was one very, very sick person. And uh, I was dragging along, but better by 2015. I got diagnosed in 2013. By 2015, I had this idea that I would be creating a website and blog that had services and products for people like myself because I knew there were over, over 23 million people with autoimmune disease, add another 50 to 75 million just in the U.S. alone who have at least one serious food allergy, millions more with intolerances, and then we had this other section of people with chronic illnesses who had to make some kind of lifestyle shift. And what I was hearing in feedback from other doctors, nurses, and mental health professionals is that these people would learn what it is they need to do, but they had a hard time implementing it. And my idea for a website and service was to create a way for them to learn the lifestyle piece. Something that wasn't really being well represented out in terms of websites. Lots of medical information, just not how to implement it. So I found myself a fantastic designer, and we got to work. I hired Natalie McGuire of Natalie McGuire Designs in Oregon. Her and I started chit-chatting about what it is that I envisioned. And then she sent me this fantastic workbook. I mean, it was amazing. It had all these different fancy words in it. And I'm not in the industry. So I was just like ooing and awing and going, wow, this is great. This is going to make it easy for me to talk about what it is I want to do and to get this beautiful end product. And now he's really into the idea that every website should be both functional and beautiful. I'm like, I'm, I'm down with that. Would be. And then things kind of got a little bit messy. We started butting heads, not in a really negative way, but in a way where I would try to say one thing and she would say another and we were almost saying the same thing, but sort of also missing each other at the same time. Now, as a behavioralist, I was like going, hmm, what's that all about? And she wanted to make certain that I understand certain concepts, so supposedly they were all laid out in her workbook. But then I would get stuck over and over again. She would say, okay, now you need to work on this section of your content. So here's a bunch of questions. And the questions were straightforward, but then what she mapped it to in terms of the labels, what she called things, I had no clue what they actually meant. If you're on the inside of the industry, then you know what you're looking for. If you say, write me an about me page, you know what you're talking about. But the client does not. The client thinks, Here's what an about me page is about. Oh, it's about everything that I've done since kindergarten to now. <laughs> it's about me. I had no clue that the about me page is far more than that. It's about more like 20% about me as a client and 80% about them. The audience out there who's not met you yet, who doesn't know about your products and services or your idea or your nonprofit or anything like that. And so if, if the client, the they in this state out there, the they, if the client doesn't get it, it looks like this. Me, 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 oh maybe you. Me, 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 oh yeah, you. Me, 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 me. It's the lady with the underwear and her pantyhose and her shirt tucked in her pantyhose. She can still do her job. She could have still presented, but she might be embarrassed later. See, the audience out there is having a hard time understanding what it is that they are going to be getting. They can read through that about the page, for example, and then kind of still walk away going, okay, well, I know a lot of stuff about the person behind this website, this blog. 
And then at the same time, the client's kind of dumbstruck as to why that audience out there doesn't get it. So some of the things that I discovered in this process of having this designer make my website is that we need to start back a little bit and I started asking for shared language. Asking her to explain what she meant by something. She thought it was really perfectly clear in her, her, in her workbook and in some ways it was. I'm not faulting her actually in, in her workbook. The workbook was great. It's just that for a person who's not a part of the industry, what she thought she was asking for was not what she was getting from me, and that's why we were butting heads. So we need some shared language. That's the cat going, oh, oh, wait on, okay, let's, let's start over again. Let's figure out what are we trying to stay. So the first steps to building, to bridging the gap that I've created, the gap between both the designer and the client, and the client and the future audience, is to develop shared language. And the way you do this, is you stop, stop doing whatever you're doing, you listen, what is the client trying to say, and then my thing, look for the thing under the thing. You do that by defining and then asking for the thing that you want, then telling them what it's called. You don't put out the word first, necessarily, the label and then expect them to know what you're asking for. Describe, then put the label to it. That's called this. I learned from my friend and most excellent Rebel Rising speech coach, coach sorry, speech coach, Dr. Michelle Mazur. She's here in Seattle. I learned that something like my about me page wasn't really about me, like I mentioned. It's more about what the audience out there is going to eventually see about why they want to work with me because they see actually themselves. That I didn't understand. I kept wanting to just talk about what I've done, why people would want to work with me because of my credentials or my background. And what I was missing is the about me was actually supposed to attract through the way of that outer audience out there being able to see themselves working with me. And that was a bit of a shift. Now you think, well, that's kind of intuitive. I challenge you, go and look up. I'm just going to pick an industry. I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular. Attorneys. Go on an attorney's website and go to their About Me page. Tell me if you are snoring by the second paragraph. Because their About Me page is full of their credentials, which are necessary for you to know if you want to hire an attorney. It's full of a lot of detail about where they went to school and what kinds of cases they may have taken and what kinds of experiences they have, and maybe some references or people gave them great reviews. But it's not really what an About Me page is about, or supposed to be about. And so most people don't get the information they actually need to make the decision of whether they want to work with you. And that's what Natalie was having a hard time translating to me, or helping me understand I needed to do in terms of the content I would hand her to design into the About Me page. Another example, so we can move away from About Me's, is this thing about mood boards. For the designers in the room, you all know what a mood board is, right? You want to ask me what I thought a mood board was when I heard that word? I thought a mood board was just the mood that I felt invested in when I would look at it, like, oh, like, this is my mood. <laughs> it's the mood that you want to project that helps attract the kind of client that you want. That's the mood board that she was talking about, but I didn't get that. Now can you see why we kept going, we're not getting it. So 
she needed to help me understand what a mood board was. Everything from how she was looking at asking me questions about what kind of logo I wanted, because I didn't have a logo. I'm going to show you some examples next, but even just that process of it, um, I needed to have her explain to me what the purpose of the logo was, to define what it is and what its true function was, because I just kept picking things based on stuff that I liked, which is fine for where you start with, but I wasn't thinking about how is my audience out there going to connect with my logo. And then I thought, well, maybe that's just me. Let me go look around. So I started looking around at other people's websites and examples of logos. And I could see the same thing. I could see logos I totally could not connect with because it was around somebody else's vision for themselves, but they forgot that extra piece. And whoever designed it with them, whether it was themselves or somebody else, didn't tell them how to bridge that gap. So secondly, after you've gotten the client to stop and then listen, you ask them questions, you can keep reminding that client to ask this question as they give you the content and the emotional mood or experience that needs to be included in their finished site. You keep asking them, how will this translate to your client out there, your future client, your future audience? My audience for my allergy advocate were people who are sick and tired. That is the number one complaint when they come to me is that they are tired all the time. They're physically tired. Uh, some of them are losing hope. When you are drained of all your energy, you can't even read a website. Mm -hmm. The fact that I'm standing here today after being hospitalized over and over again, of going from having a double master's and being able to memorize talks like this, to having to rely on notes because my cognitive processes were interrupted for about two years, and so I'm building it back since then. Now I understand what my audience is feeling. So everything into this design started reflecting that. She gave me a sample and I go, that font is too hard for a tired person to read. Make it darker, make it bigger, make it easier to read, give it shape. Um, so I didn't always have the label, like I can't exactly say I want this kind of font because that's, I'm not in the industry. But I know it when I saw it. And so then we could dialogue that way. Fonts needed to be darker, easier to read, not tiny. Images needed to pop. Content needed to address illness dead on and not be sanitized. What I mean by sanitized, we have nice, polite ways of saying things. I had the challenge of talking about some very, very personal medical issues, not just personal me, but personal age point of view. We're all humans, but all of us need to take a poop. And sometimes it's not very pretty. <laughs> For people who have gastrointestinal issues, of which a lot of people in the autoimmune community do, we're talking about IBS, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease being one of them, and a whole host of other autoimmune conditions, the time they spend in the bathroom is, can be quite painful and, and very, very intense. And so we made certain that that concept would not be sanitized. So the first things you see are not about me, it's about them. So this is the, one of the first pages you'll see when you pull up the final design that we came up with. Feel your body doesn't have to be so gut-wrenching. If you go to other websites of similar content about food allergies, about autoimmune disease, you don't see that. You see more of the about me stuff, the more commonplace is what I was thinking of. And instead, we decided to go in the opposite direction. 
how can the outer audience out there already see themselves here? Uh, the funny thing is that when Nala came up with this idea of saying, like, really working with me to try to put something like this up front, she said, you have to show me how you want to sell it to the people out there. And my first response was, well, I'm not in sales. And so this third challenge that you want to help your clients with is to bridge this other gap when they tell you or demonstrate that they really don't understand how to sell their product or service. They're going to get hung up in a stall because of this word sales and sales copy. <coughs> they don't understand what it is that you're asking information for. And in my case, when she asked me for sales copy, I, I it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I gave her a bunch of stuff that sounds like about me. No surprise, right? Again, I'm not in the industry. I didn't know what she was asking for. So I gave her more about me content. And she came back and said, that's more about me content. I, I need sales content. I need sales copy. And I, I just went, OK, I don't know what you're asking for. So she walked me through it. So some of the ways that you can identify if your clients are getting hung up at this spot is that they stall, um, they give you more about me stuff, the copy looks super duper busy, it's hard to understand, um, it might be not from the audience's point of view at all. So if an audience member were to read it, they're going, this is more about the person I don't understand what I'm purchasing. And at this point, Natalie did probably one of the best things she possibly could. She said, if you're stuck here, I think that you should think about talking to someone who writes sales copy. If this is what you're saying, that's okay. And it was such a relief because I thought I was stuck with it as her client trying to come up with sales copy and not understanding what it is that she was looking for. We could have just bashed around with that for another three months. That's not what I do. But it's not really what she did. So she said, it's OK. Let's find you a person who can write good sales copy. And so I did find someone. And that person worked with me. And again, didn't put the label on saying, we're going to write sales copy now. She just asked the right questions. I gave her the content. And then she showed me how it lines up into five different areas to put into my uh, into a page and then I sent that over to Natalie and said, is this what you want? And she said, yes, this is sales copy. Okay, so now we're on back on track. So one of the options is you could refer someone who writes good sales copy to do that piece of it and then use that shared language for communicating it. Don't use any industry words. You also have the option to build off of anything that your client does know, for example, that they have said that they liked on other people's websites and kind of work off of that. So you might not have to have um, your client hire out an additional person. Um, one of the other things I thought about was from the audience's point of view, in the finished sales copy, does that audience member then know how, one, to get a consultation, or purchase a product, or why they're purchasing it, and what benefits they would get out of it, and what they could do with that knowledge if they bought that product or service now or in the future. And for many of you, that's very, very intuitive. For me, after looking at all these different websites that never answered those questions, it wasn't as intuitive for me to understand that until that was pointed out to me. Then I could look up samples of websites out there in the wild internets and go, oh, I have no clue what I'd be buying. Ah, now I've got to write it so that the people out there do know. And from there, we got this final front page. So the new board 
photos were all taken and based on not just the mood that I was in in the moment, but the mood that I wanted to put my future audience in. And that is because we came up with what my friend Dr. Michelle Laser calls her three word rebellion. A way for me to remember what I'm all about. Why did I want to create this, this website in the first place? And my mission became this three word rebellion making food fun again. It's actually four words. She said, close enough. And we made all of the pictures and all the colors about fun. So there's the limes, there's the oranges, there's the, uh, the plate that's ready to put food on it, customized to you versus prescribing to people what they're going to eat. And the lines in front of the eyes being very silly. We had tons of fun doing the photography for the site. And I want to summarize what I've said before to say we want to strive to understand the thing under the thing by asking questions, stopping, listening, developing the shared language. You want to mind the gaps in what your client understands about translating that, that idea to the audience that's out there waiting to hear about their products and services. And then you want to help your client avoid the pitfalls of the useless about me page. Or, you know, another way of just saying that is get them past the me, 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 okay, me, 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 me stage by helping them discover what the About Me page is about. I'll say one last thing about that. I think that it's actually pretty healthy for clients to come to you with natural narcissism. Not all narcissism is bad. It means that they believe in the mission of their idea. They've already sold it to themselves. They just don't know how to sell it out there. That's for you as a designer. That's for you as a programmer, that's where you, as a part of the design team, can help get them past their natural narcissism so that they can reach that audience out there. But at the same time, it's more, it's more uh, passion than it is narcissism. Right. So it doesn't just end up being, this is what I did in the past, meaning me. It becomes, this is what I'm passionate about to share with you. You're absolutely right. Thank you. And I do want to say a couple words about why WordPress, because obviously these websites can be put on to anything. I'm just going to go by default and come back to it that there's so many people out there who want and have good ideas that they want to turn into websites, but they have no idea how to run the website. I come from the mental health community, so lots and lots of people in private practice, their idea of a website is creating a static one-page thing that stays the same for the next 12 years. And you can go out there and look at it, and it looks like their websites are dead. And I thought, if I'm going to do this, why not put a website out there? Mine needs to look like there's some activity going on. It needs mm -hmm. to look active. It needs to look like it can build a community. Where should I go? WordPress. It just so happened that Natalie was really, really keen on the idea of handing it off to me on WordPress. She had worked with client after client who was just like me, who had no design background, no tech background. And she would teach them, hand them off on WordPress, and get them going so they could go underneath the hood and do all the kinds of things that I love to be able to do. One is control. I mean, how many of us don't have some control issues? You want to be able to get into your site anytime and if something changes and be able to do that overnight or within an hour because I have seen this happen before that something changes and then I've got friends going, I can't change this on my website because I don't know how. So many times. There's things in my industry that just change really quickly. How many of you have heard that there is a vaccine that is being developed for celiac disease? If you've seen it, okay, Maria has in the back. If you don't know anything about celiac disease, you would have never heard of it. But it's kind of a big deal 
even though in another way it's not a big deal. But in terms of the research community, this is a big deal. And if, by some chance, this were to actually be passed through the FDA approval on a fast track and was available in, say, 2019, which it inevitably could be. If you were in my industry in healthcare, you would want to be able to change everything on your website very, very quickly to adapt to that. Now, I happen to be of the opinion it's not going to be that earth shattering, but if it were, I want to have the power to go in there and change it and not have to wait on somebody else to do it. Because I can tell you, I just know too many people who have old material on their sites that they don't have a clue how to change. And it's really unfortunate because we have such powerful tools. So I like the control, I like the ease of use. The WordPress community has just done such a fantastic job in making these tools easy to use. And if not easy, then they have tutorials. And if not tutorials, they have help desks. And if not help desks, you can write in and ask any question you want and get an answer fairly quickly or a forum of people answering the question, and I love that. It makes me feel less alone. Um, I like the response. Um, again, it's about how quick that I can get in there and how quickly I can see people react to the changes that I make. I've been using WordPress since 2009, and I've never looked back since. I can see in the clients of this designer that I work with, Natalie, that they too are experiencing some of the same things. So I'll look at the bottom of the page after it says Natalie McGuire Design, and I'll say powered by WordPress, or some other indication that it has been transferred onto WordPress. And I then know, as I watch different owners of sites making little updates, and I'm like, ooh, yeah, I can do that too. of the logo that we ended up with. Um, I love the fact that there's some verbs on there, and it's an empty play. I mean, we're here to collaborate and see what's going to end up on your plate, what's for dinner. The way you contact me is through my email address there, which is email at myallergyadvocate.com. If you forget how to spell email, just remember, it's in your phone. I-M-E-I, the I -M -E -I number in your phone. I purposely left a huge amount of time for you to ask questions because I think this is the dialogue stuff that you can't do to something like, why isn't this working? Um, I have a little bit of imposter syndrome. I have a tendency to blame everything on myself. And oftentimes the problem is, again, the thing under the thing and something we've created or collaborated on together to get into a challenge and then also something we can collaborate on to get out of the challenge. So I'd like to use the rest of the time to think about some questions or case studies that we can talk about together that fall under this winding the gap and looking for the thing under the thing. So I'm going to open up questions. So I just went to the session on monetizing your, the web page and the woman who spoke before. Do you do that with your web page or is that your intent or is that, um, or is it just more of an information source? It started out as an information resource, but we started small with just a couple of services. So one of them are for people who are just newly diagnosed with a food allergy, or two, or three or more, or a serious autoimmune issue, or both, and they really have no clue where to start. I have everything from basic batch cooking 101 to a virtual grocery shopping trip where I go with them with their phone into their grocery store and they show me the backs of labels and things they're thinking about buying and I teach them how to read labels. I teach them how to shop and put things together or to think about how to cook two times a week for all seven days of the week, things like that. So that's a service and we built that into um, my website. So I thought about some 
services and then put selling them as a product. You can buy them in pieces if you want, or they can buy um, 30 days of group coaching. So say they have a small community of people and they want to learn how to do this together, they can then come in as a group and I would teach them virtually um, through like different uh, internet-based programs and they can watch demonstrations of pretty much anything you want to know about the lifestyle pieces, whether it was adding in meditation for stress reduction, um, learning how to get active, how to cook again, or how to clean out their entire house for every kind of personal hygiene, um, environmental issue, or food issue, because these people are so sensitive. Um, it can be just the tiniest thing. Well, this just happened, for example. How many of you knew that the resin on your apples could contain gluten? She does, we go. Lots of other people haven't heard this. So that was a new one to me. I actually just recently got a tiny bit of a gluten exposure by eating an apple that I had thoroughly double scrubbed the resin off of that apple. So the wax got fine. Not fun. So we talk about this in a group setting, and that was another kind of so great question. Thank you. Anybody else? There was a group out there who contacted me. They were called the Center for Chronic Illness, and they're located in Seattle, it's a new.org. And they wanted to put a list of different kinds of medical and mental health providers. One of the things that's really true when you get a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease or a food allergy or chronic illness is that um, you can experience a lot of anxiety and depression. That's just kind of built into the experience. It's a feature. And so they wanted to list me there. And I thought, well, this is interesting because that would mean that some people will see that and want to hire me for my counseling background. And others might want to hire me for my coaching side, the less medical side of the picture. And they could choose. So this side is all coaching and no medical. The Seattle Direct Counseling, which is my other practice, that's all mental health. And the state of Washington does not want us to mix the two. So unfortunately, I can't actually bill out this stuff under the counseling session. So they're either hiring me for counseling or they're hiring me for coaching and not both. With a small area that I would call is in that Venn diagram section, what we have in common is that Washington State believes that whenever a person receives counseling from a, a licensed mental health therapist, there's always some coaching involved. So some of the people who have an autoimmune disease say, uh, I'm just going to pick one, multiple sclerosis. They're going to have depression and anxiety going on, right? That's what I've been treating them for. Will they ask me questions about their autoimmune disease? Absolutely. Will they want some coaching on that? Sure. Can I put that in, build that into part of the therapy? Yes. We have about five minutes left. So what is your uh, process of determining what content you're going to write for your audience? Great question. I started a Facebook Live and business page and would start taking my questions from the audience themselves. So as they bring up issues, um, I start a closed group. They would ask me questions and I'd say, can I take this question and actually build content around it? Because it was a great question. So I rely then on my audience to tell me what I should write about next. I have a little idea for you. Um, I know you deal with autoimmune diseases. Do you deal with anything else like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, absolutely. Um, if it's just weight issues that's not tied to another disease state, such as 
um, type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, that's the autoimmune version of diabetes, right? Then yes, if it's just weight and eating, not as many people are going to be attracted to my website because they don't see themselves on those first pages, right? I don't talk anything about weight control. Right. Not that I couldn't because it's part of my counseling stuff and I deal with people who um, are in treatment for eating disorders, binge eating included. Uh, but again, I keep that very separate. So there's a very different emphasis for this website. I guess the other part is that was like normal about Right, right. Um, if you can put it under chronic illness, yes. Um, do you ever feature any other stories um, on your blog from, from either readers or like other people that might be sharing those same experiences? That's a fantastic, fantastic uh, question. I was just texting my sister, and the question was, do, do I ever feature the stories of other people, say readers, who are writing in? And I was just requesting information from a school teacher's, the chef at the school, to ask about what the kids want to eat if they have food issues. So yes, I will be, I said, can I, can you put me in contact with this person so I can hear what it's like for this person who cooks 800 meals a day, um, what it's like to provide for everyone plus the kids with special food needs. Yeah, great idea. I know you make sense a little bit on that. So like, um, when you're uh, getting these stories from other people, do you have access for, for like what kind of questions to ask and like, um, like how to um, capture their stories about like uh, victimization or exploitation? No. I'm brand new at this, but um, because I'm a counselor, I will say this. I'm really big into safety and privacy. I always ask for consent. Can I share about this? Is this okay? Do you want me in, in, to make this anonymous? Do you want me to change your gender if I'm telling the story? I absolutely do that. And that's why I protect my license. It's required um, for them to, to protect the person 